All right. Well, uh, hi, everybody, and thank you very much for tuning in to our first podcast here at NAS. Um, I'm Dr. Mark Irwin. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Toronto in the Department of Surgery and Divisions of Orthopedic and Neurological Surgery. Uh, and I am, uh, I think, in my third term in a sec- on the section of biologics of North American Spine Society. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Zori Busser. And uh, Zori, I'll maybe I'll pass over to you to introduce yourself. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Zori Boozer. Um, I'm a director of research at Girling Institute and a research assistant professor at the uh, uh, Department of Orthopedic Surgery at NYU. And as Mark, I've been, uh, this is my uh, third term, uh, I believe, at the section of uh, biologics and basic science research at NAS. And really excited about our podcast. Well, thanks very much, Zori. So I, I guess we'll get to the point. We only got about 15 minutes or so. So the, the title we chose for this first go-round is uh, Degenerative Disc Disease, What's in a Name? The idea being that there, there's a lot of, um, I won't say confusion, but debate about when is an aging disc a degenerative disc? And what's the difference between aging and degeneration? So we thought we'd maybe start off with a discussion about some of the important aspects of these particular elements of changes within disc biology as these we hope as we go along in a future other podcast we can talk about other elements like pain and imaging and maybe uh, appropriate or, or maybe promising or uh, interventional strategies regeneration and so forth so we hope that today's discussion will kind of get us on the same uh, level playing field of understanding and then we can kind of go from there so let's talk about that elephant in the room here so when is a dark disc on MRI in an older person just aging? And when is it degeneration? Like what, 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 what is the difference? Well, I think the key here, and there's some oh, great papers about this, uh, talk about how all um, aging discs have some elements of degeneration, but not all degenerative discs necessarily have aging associated with them. So it seems to be a kind of a continuum of, of, of issues here. And, you know, what leading to aging, you know, we've got, you know, a reactive oxygen species changes, we have DNA damage, we have load bearing over time, there's a history of past trauma, certainly genetics involved, and, and to some degree, there's an ability of the disc to repair. I think it really comes down to necessary and sufficient kind of aspects here, in, in that if the disc is injured significantly, it may exceed the ability of the, of the disc to repair itself versus maybe a smaller uh, injuries. And that also speaks to genetic influences too, if they're mild or more significant that may, be, may or may not lead to more profound differences down the road. So what we do know, and it's pretty well shown now that they're subject to whatever um, causative elements of which there are many, as I mentioned, Mm-hmm. There seems to be a change in the milieu within the disc, particularly in the nucleus, where there is a, a shift in this sort of um, homeostatic regulation of things, such that you get an increase in the catabolic influences and a decrease in the anabolic influences, such that it over, th- these processes, the catabolic pro-inflammatory processes, overtake the ability of the disc cells to maintain their their uh, homeostatic regulation. We know there's a whole bunch of pro-inflammatory cytokines that get involved, that, that are intimately involved in these series of events. And to that end, I'm going to ask Zori to comment on, on what these pro-inflammatory cytokines do and how they work and what's the impact on, on the disc and the exercise matrix and so forth. So Zori, please. Yes. So No, Mark, I do agree. And it's, it's very confusing. I just want to take a step back when we talk about degenerative disc disease, any type versus aging. It is that they cover very similar pathways, but really what happens is that degeneration, as you said, happens prematurely or it's accelerated and it's really cell-driven process. And I know, as you said, we will touch upon later in our podcasts, what's a painful, what's a non-painful degenerated disc. But that's where, um, as we discuss cytokines, as we discuss those pathways and think about regenerative therapies, it's really important to distinguish and recognize early degeneration versus a painful advanced degeneration. Because I think we can say that in the early degeneration, those discs are still structurally intact. 
which means that maybe the inflammation is still low and the degradation of the extracellular matrix is not as high as in painful discs that we will kind of come back later on and talk about some signals. So what happens during the degeneration, there is, as you said, a really a wide array, primarily of pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-1, IL-6 that come in and provoke various cascades that ultimately lead to a matrix degradation. And they, I know that we don't have time to go into all the uh, different cytokines and molecules, but really what happens is they activate proteolytic enzymes, the two main groups, the uh, MMPs and ADAMTS enzymes that really cleave and cut uh, co their collagens, primarily collagen two, and also agrican and other proteoglycans. And when we think about um, those changes, people just think about degradation of proteoglycans. But the other thing that also changes during these uh, cascades is that those the chemi let's simplify it from a clinical perspective, the chemistry, the sulfates change as well. So the disc cannot retain water anymore at the way it did. So what's happening, there are changes in the proteoglycans and those sulfates, decreased water content, and that ultimately leads to a reduction in swelling pressure and decrease in the disc height. So with all of that, because that really then impact. So what's happening is there is a decrease in the disc height and we are losing all those uh, different matrix molecules. Um, there is really even more pressure on the disc and disc cells to perform in such a hypoxic environment because we know disc is one of the, the largest acellular um, tissue. So obviously hypoxic environment, there is degradation and there is glycolysis, buildup of lactic acid, which then further draw, is lowering pH. And then that will definitely lead to disc cell senescence, apoptosis. And with all of that happening, I would really love to know what do you think are the other triggers during disc degeneration that might differentiate them from just simple aging? Yeah, oh, I, and it's, it's, I think that's a, the million dollar question, right? Uh, this, this, as you mentioned, it's a very stereotypical cascade of events. It also involves, you know, fragmentation of proteoglycan core proteins like biglycan and fibronectin and other ones. That, and when that happens, that further accelerates the degenerative cascade of events, right? We have, we have a failure of stem of intervertebral disc derived stem cells to be able to accommodate any, any kind of repair. And that particularly happens with a more aged and degenerative disc in particular. But I think that also, you know, that as you touched on this, what I think the important thing here is that once these enzymatic cleavage processes and pro-catabolic sequence of events occurs, that's what leads to structural failure. And I think that's when we're talking about the true degenerative disc, as it were. You know, buckling, uh, loss of ECM um, matrix uh, uh, viability, I guess I'd say, enough cleavage of collagen, like, like you said, to impair uh, uh, load bearing, which then from a clinician's point of view, loss of disc height leads to facet imbrication, the facet joints start to override and have increased load bearing, which leads to osteoarthritis in the facet joints, enlarged ligamentum flavum. All of these are kind of downstream events, right, of, of the degenerative disc itself. So to your point, from a regenerative therapy point of view, when do you intervene? When is it even possible? So I think that you're right, that earlier is better. And earlier, I think, is uh, in the cascade of events is, is the time when any kind of regenerative therapeutic may have its best option because things before things are permanent. For example, you know, you mentioned hypoxia and ischemia in the disc and can you speak to one of the, one of the theories now about end plates and, and 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 circulation to the disc and how that may impact this whole thing? Yeah, so I mean, as we know, end plates are really uh, in young, in healthy discs, really the main gateway for nutrition. And as we age, and I believe research has there, there's been a lot of research about end plate changes that impact the disc degeneration, but 
what we've seen, uh, what the histological studies, and again, a lot of biomechanical and cadaver studies have shown that end plates start losing permeability in the second decade of our life. And that really changes that microenvironment that uh, is switching the, in a way, not to simplify it, but if we look from a regenerative perspective, it's changing it from anabolic more to catabolic microenvironment. And it's starting to drive um, more of degenerative cascade. And then there are a lot of theories that, um, and actually research about, because this is also avascular tissue, increased innervation and also blood vessel influx. So what do you think about nociceptors well, it's funny you should say that. I thank you. The great segue. I was going to ask about that because we know that with with degeneration and cleavage of these MMPs and uh, collagens, rather aggregate, all that sort of thing, that disc cells change a bit in terms of their behavior. So it seems to happen as the expression of these pro-inflammatory cytokines increases the expression of neurotrophic factors found within the disc nucleus, even and annulus. And these factors like uh, nerve growth factor and brain-derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF are, have been shown to attract neurite ingrowth. And that's part of the, of the attempt of the disc to repair. You know, you get a neovascularization and neo innervation. It's been shown, as you know very well, that, that nerve fibers have been shown to grow inside the disc, which you can't detect in any imaging way. So you have no way of knowing. But these, these neurotrophic changes seem to be very, very important in terms of it, 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 the changes associated with that talk to DRG-related nerves and, and the afferent supply from the, from the disc to the DRG that helped involved in uh, processing of pain. So trying to sort out disc sources of pain is a, is a really complicated problem. But I, I think it's, and now we'll be talking about that more in a future podcast, right? But I guess for, uh, for, for at this point in the game, I think that we can agree that aging and degeneration are probably on the same pathway, but they might represent different places on the, on that pathway. And if you, once you mentioned, like you mentioned about the cap capillary network on the end plates, once you get too far down the road, I think you're really into a degenerative situation versus an aging one, you know, and, and I know it's, it's kind of an arbitrary uh, 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 endpoint, but I, th I think we can agree on that. And, and it's a co consequence of the role of kind of uncontrolled pro-inflammatory uh, anti-anabolic effects, failure of the disc and disc cells to, to be able to maintain their function. And then that, I think, was what leads to disc collapse and so forth and the overtly degenerative disc and all the other things I mentioned a minute ago. As compared to the aging disc, it goes dark in MRI, but doesn't have all these you know, pro-inflammatory degradative loss of matrix synthesis, it's somehow able to tolerate these changes. I think, I think that's kind of, is that fair to say? Is that kind of where we are? I think so. And I do have, I know we have a couple of minutes left, but I do want to actually take a step back because we've now uh, in this first podcast have covered just some hallmarks of this degeneration. And as we are thinking about regenerative therapies, and in a way, why we don't have the right one yet and who's the right patient. I really want to take actually a big step back and talk about spine origin and see if we are missing something there. So can you comment on we are spine origin and the cells and why many animal models that we actually use for regenerative um, therapies never get through the degenerative cascades that we see in 40-year-olds in our patients who actually could potentially help get help from a regenerative injection? I think that's a really good question. I, I certainly have an interest in the area. Um, you know, the disc nucleus originates from the cord and the annulus comes from other sort of uh, undifferentiated tissues. And in humans, we lose notochordal cells in late childhood or so. But rabbits don't, and mongrel dogs, so-called non chondrostrophic dogs, do not, and they don't get this disease. So, you know, it's been shown, and our labs have done a lot of this work, has shown that notochordal cells secrete important anabolic growth factors. And it may be, it's a consequence of price you pay of being bipedal. Maybe by being on two legs and up tall, all the compressive loads on the spine 
That has something to do with the loss of these cells. We don't know because beagle dogs lose monocortical cells, but mongrel dogs don't. So they're all dogs. So there's got to be some genetic reason for it. But the important thing being that as long as those cells are there, manufacturing the important things that they manufacture, the disc is protected from injury. So it may well be that re resupplying the disc with these vital molecules or proteins at the right time, and that speaks to your question, your point earlier about who's the right patient, maybe that'll be a benefit, but then, you know, you're still fighting this pro-catabolic sort of, sort of sequence of events, right? So I think timing really matters and sort of things like dose and all that stuff and how often do you want to deliver it and how do you deliver it to a disc? So we'll talk about that stuff, I think, in a future podcast when we get to imaging and things like that, right? But anyway, so I, I, think, I think that's a good point. And I, I do think there's some value in, in exploring our developmental biology as we try to figure out appropriate um, regenerative therapeutics. And we'll talk about stem cells and stuff at, at, at a future date as well. So um, anything, anything else you want to add, Zori, at this point? I think we've covered all the basics uh, we need to for uh, diving into the next podcast. Okay. Okay, great. Well, then in that, in that case, I guess maybe we'll wrap this up for now and I hope it was in, uh, instructive and helpful. And I think that also the ther clinicians out there can kind of maybe take some lessons home here from about the molecular pathways that occur, because, you know, there's all kinds of non-surgical therapeutics like traction and things that make all kinds of claims. And when you think about what's really going on there, mm -hmm. it's hard to understand how some of those claims could actually work. So I think it's important to think, think these things through. So on that note, then thank you very much, Zori. It's great seeing you. And I look forward to our next podcast. And thank you very much for tuning in.